Wednesday night, game one of the Wales Conference Final, the Boston Bruins against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Going into this series, the Penguins seemed a little outmatched. Not a lot of playoff experience, a hurt Lemieux, and a suspect defense. Boston, on the other hand, has been to the Stanley Cup Final two of the last three years, so they have the experience and the balanced attack. But this has been the year of surprises and upsets. Game one would set the stage. Just before the game, Penguins coach Bob Johnson was leaving nothing to chance. He even measured the rink. Penguins open the scoring early in the first. Phil Bork controls. He feeds Joe Mullen. And Pittsburgh goes up early in this one, one to nothing. Still in the first, Boston ties it on the power play. Craig Janney comes in all alone, puts in the back hand, and that ties it up at one. The Penguins regain the lead, though, on a power play of their own. Tic-tac-toe passing here. Kevin Stevens nets his eighth of the playoffs. Pittsburgh goes up by one, two to one the score. Before the first ends, the Penguins turn it over. Vladimir Rizichka to Janney to Neely. And that ties it up at two after a period of play. Boston strikes early in the second. Barrasso gives it away, and before he knows what he's done, Bob Sweeney slides it home. Boston's now up three to two. Later on in the second, the Penguins get the equalizer. A shot from the point is redirected into the net by the skate of Mario Lemieux, but it's ruled no goal. Later on in the second, Pittsburgh gives it up again. Janney swipes it over to Neely. A little fake, and right into the net. Bruins up by two, four to two, the score. Moving to the third, the Penguins have moved to within one, four to three. Dave Poulin feeds Dave Christian, and the Bruins go up five to three. Ray Bork added another. Boston takes game one of the Wales final, winning this one six to three. So scoring for the Brunies, the Brunies, the Bruins. It was Danny. Neely with a pair, Sweeney, Christian, and Bork for Pittsburgh. It was Mullen, Stevens, and Airy. The four hottest teams in the Campbell Conference this season were Chicago, St. Louis, Los Angeles, and Calgary. They were four of the best teams in the NHL, but when the Campbell Conference final begins Thursday, none of these teams will be on the ice. It'll be Minnesota and Edmonton battling for a shot at the Stanley Cup. The Oilers finished 11th overall this season while the Stars were 16th. Here's Ken Chilibet. This matchup is one few people would have predicted when the regular season ended, that's for sure. But the Oilers are not that surprised with the success of the North Stars so far. They know there could be some big pitfalls ahead for them, and they had better watch their step. They're a team that should be here. I mean, they didn't do it with mirrors. They did it with a lot of hard work, and uh, they did it with a good team concept, and, and they deserve to be here. They finished uh, the season stronger than any team there, so it's not a real surprise to us, but it's been a a great feat for them to, to defeat the first and third place teams overall. As workmen attempt to repair a broken sewer line outside the Oilers dressing room, the players have their minds on one thing only, the North Stars. Now offensively, the big story has been Essa Tikkanen. He's been their leader so far, as both a goal scorer and as a checker. Of course, John Muckler is going to give Tikkanen free reign to go on the offense against the North Stars. Oh, I don't think we'll play uh, anybody on their team man-to-man, -man, such as we played Wayne Gretzky. Uh, we have to be concerned about certain people. I mean, they do have some good offensive hockey players that are capable of breaking games open. So you have to be aware of uh, who's on the ice. There's no question about that, but I don't think we'll go man-to-man. -man. Now, ironically, the road to the Oilers' very first Stanley Cup some seven years ago featured the North Stars in the Campbell Conference Final. Now, the Oilers swept that series in four straight. A few Oilers are still around including netminder Grant Fuhr. Now, Fuhr says he'll be ready to go tomorrow night, even with the Bruce Army suffered against Los Angeles. If Fuhr remembers that first series against the North Stars. It was a long time ago, but I mean, it was, it was a good series. I'm sure it's going to be a good series this time. They're a good hockey club. I don't think people give them enough credit. I mean, they've beat some good hockey teams, and they've done it by working hard. So we have our work cut out for us. Every Oiler player I talked to is very impressed with the Minnesota North Stars. They know they're going to be closely checked, and secondly, they can't afford to take any dumb penalties. The North Stars' power play is the best of any team so far in the playoffs, but there are two good reasons that the Oilers can't take the North Stars lightly. One, the Chicago Blackhawks, the other, the St. Louis Blues, the two teams Minnesota beat to get here. Game one of the Campbell Conference Championship coming up tomorrow. Ken Chilobek, TSN in Edmonton. Today on Sports Desk, Bob Ganey and his North Stars hope to continue their upset run. 
Another masterful pitching performance. Can the Blue Jays reap the benefits? And the verbal barrage begins for Desert Storm 2. Welcome to Sports Desk, everyone. I'm Chris Seedens. Also coming up in the next half hour, Canada takes on the Soviets of the World Hockey Championships in Finland. Empty seats at the Big O in Montreal means still more big problems for the Expos. And the complete story from Thursday night in the NBA playoffs. But we will start with the NHL playoffs, the Stanley Cup playoffs. It usually takes a new coach at least one season to pull his team together and start implementing his own systems. Bob Ganey managed to do all that in just three months. After the All-Star break, the North Stars made their move. Since then, they've been simply amazing, knocking off the Chicago Blackhawks and the St. Louis Blues in the first two rounds of the playoffs. The question Thursday night was, would this Cinderella story continue? They faced their toughest challenge yet against the defending Stanley Cup champion, Edmonton Oilers. Let's go to the action now. Just two minutes into the game, Oilers are on the power play. Steve Smith from the high slot beats John Casey between the legs. Oilers with the early 1-0 lead. Later in the period, Alf Dolan will feed Neil Broughton, who picks the top corner. Game is tied at one. North Stars would not look back. Still in the first, Dave Gagne sends Mike Madano in all alone. One-on-one -on -one with Grant Fuhr. Madano shoots wide of the net. We're still tied at one. Second period, Broughton's shot will be blocked. Gagne on the doorstep, his sixth goal of the playoffs, and it's 2-1 North Stars. We go to the third period. Dolan from the boards. Feeds Gaetan Duchesne for his first of the playoffs. As he redirects it past Pure Stars, take a 3-1 lead, and they hang on to upset the Oilers and take a 1-0 lead in this best of seven Campbell Conference final. It was Broughton, Gagne, and Duchesne for Minnesota. Steve Smith with a lone goal for Edmonton. With more on game one of the Campbell Conference final, let's join Ken Chilebeck at the Northlands Coliseum. The Cinderella story for the Minnesota North Stars continues. Game one featured basically what the North Stars have done throughout the playoffs, a good team effort and a lot of hard work. With a few breaks and a couple of good saves, we were able to get through the beginning of the game and fight our way out of the first period with a tie. The rest of the game I thought was pretty even. Uh, the chances uh, at both ends of the ice were even and the game was open right until the last few minutes when we we capitalized on one of our chances. It's difficult, I guess, coming off two series like we came off in the month of games that we played in the overtime but, but that'll come now there's no question that it won't uh, I know this team well enough that they'll come back and uh, we'll play the way we're capable of playing and we'll play with a lot of emotion from here on in yeah this is a big win I mean we come in here and you know you're a little scared of the Oilers Stanley Cup champion you know they got all the names they got a lot of speed and you know you give them a lot of respect but at the same time uh, you know, we played well to get here, and it's, you know, this team doesn't believe we're a fluke anymore, you know, so we believe in ourselves, and we just keep working. The Oilers know they're in for a tough series. That's pretty evident now. Emotion was lacking on behalf of the Oilers. That was for sure in game one. In bet, John Muckler hopes that emotion is back for game two. Ken Chulebeck, TSN in Edmonton. The Boston Bruins will carry a 1-0 series lead as they hit the ice for Game 2 of the Wales Conference Final against the Pittsburgh Penguins on Friday night. The Bruins won the opener 6-3, playing with just two days rest after winding up a tough seven-game series against the Montreal Canadiens. The Penguins had a six-day break after manhandling Washington in five. These teams have met twice before in the playoffs. Boston winning both times Game 2 of the series once again Friday night at the Boston Garden. The National Hockey League Awards will be presented on June 5th, and Thursday we learned who the finalists are. It's interesting to note that since all the balloting was done before the playoffs, only two of the 15 finalists for major awards are still playing. But still, what a year for Hawks goaltender Ed Belfort. He's nominated along with Wayne Gretzky and Brett Hall for the Hart Trophy. The battle for best defenseman is among Ray Bork, Chris Chelios, and Al McInnes. Last year, Sergei Makarov of the Calgary Flames was awarded the Calder Trophy as Rookie of the Year. Could fellow Soviet Sergei Fedorov of Detroit do it this year? Well, he's got some strong competition from the likes of Ed Belfour and Ken Hodge Jr. For the Vesna Trophy, Ed Belfour, Mike Richter, Patrick Roy are the candidates. And the coaches nominated for the Adams Trophy have all been knocked out of the playoffs so far, but they are still among the best in the business. 
The Ottawa Senators have received Paul Eicher's proposal to invest in their NHL expansion. Today on Sports Desk, a big night in Beantown as Mario the Magnificent attempts to steal away home ice advantage from the Bruins. Roger Clemens makes his return from a suspension to pitch against the White Sox. And the Boston Celtics look to put an end to an inspired Indiana Pacer team. Sports Desk is brought to you by Suzuki, makers of Swift, Samurai, and Sidekick. If it's Suzuki, it's all right. Welcome to Sports Disc, everyone. I'm Chris Edens. Also coming up in the next half hour, Dan Sherry takes to the ring in Hamilton in defense of his Canadian middleweight championship belt. And the Montreal Expos were looking to make it four straight wins as they played host to the San Diego Padres. But first, to the Stanley Cup playoffs. And when you're playing in the Stanley Cup semifinals, your big guns really have to come through for you. Much is expected from the Lemieux and Neelys. If they perform well, their team should have a good chance at winning. Lemieux has, checked, has been checked tightly in game one of the uh, series by Bob Sweeney. He managed just one assist, and Penguins lost that game. The Bruins count on Cam Neely to score, and so far, he has done just that. Coming into action on Friday night, 14 playoff goals this year for Neely, just five short of the NHL record for most playoff goals in a season. And he has been checked very closely in this one. Af Elf Samuelson with the big hit at the blue line. And you know what? Cam didn't like it one bit. Then Peter Taglianetti with the cross check on Cam Neely. Actually, a couple players with a cross check. Taglianetti goes to the box. Now on the power play, Ruzichka to Janney to Neely. Neely scores his 15th of the playoffs. Now needs only four to reach the uh, playoff record. one nothing Boston. Bob Sweeney continues to shadow Mario Lemieux here. The leather sandwich, no penalty. Later in the period, Glenn Wesley from the blue line. His shot deflects off Taglianetti's stick. 2-1 Bruins lead. Late in the first, Pittsburgh ties it. Who else? Mario Lemieux with the wraparound. 2-2 after 20 minutes. Second period now, and the Bruins take the lead. Ray Bork from the high slot. His sixth goal of the playoffs. 3-2 Boston, just 38 seconds in. Could we be seeing Frank Pietrangelo later in this series? Well, middle of the second period. Mario Lemieux has had enough of Bob Sweeney's close checking. High stick Sweeney. Sweeney is not cut, but Mario is off for two minutes. Bob Johnson says, oh, brother. Third period. Now, game is tied at three. Vintage. Mario Lemieux goes in on Andy Moog. Great deke. 4-3 Penguins. Late in the third period. Now, Penguins with two men in the box. Bruins applying the pressure. Ray Bork receives the pass. Takes the one-timing shot. Ruzicka to Janney. He scores Boston's third power play goal of the game. 4-4. We're headed for overtime. And in the extra period, Christian with the backhand. Barrasso the save. The rebound comes to Vladimir, Vladimir Ruzicka, who scores as the Bruins win it. Ruzicka with a goal and four assists on the night. And Boston now leads this series 2-0. The goal scorers, Stevens, Lemieux with a pair, and Recchi for Pittsburgh. Neely, Wesley, Bork, Janney, and Ruzicka for Boston. The Bruins outshot the Penguins 8-1 in overtime. Now let's take a quick look at Cam Neely's numbers. Most goals in one playoff season. Newsy Lalonde, Reggie Leach, and Yeri Curry all with 19. Lalonde did it in 10 games back in 1919. Leach in 16 games in 76. Curry in 18 games in 1985. Cam Neely now has 15 goals in 15 games. And he is on pace to break that record. The Minnesota North Stars are still being called a Cinderella story, and yes, there is no doubt they are the biggest surprise of the playoffs this year, but keep in mind, the North Stars have been the hottest team in the NHL since the All-Star break. How do they stack up against the Edmonton Oilers, you ask? Well, in four games against Edmonton this year, they've given up just four goals. Last night, in Game 1 of the Campbell Conference Final, the Oilers scored just over three minutes into the game, but after that, John Casey was simply unbeatable. With more on these amazing North Stars, Here's Ken Chilibeck. The North Stars continued their surprising second season last night. With the game tied in the second period, Dave Gagne puts in the loose puck for his sixth playoff goal to give the North Stars a 2-1 lead. In the third period, Ulf Dahlen continued his solid playoff performance. He feeds Gaetan Duchesne, who one-times it past Grant Fuhrer. 
The North Stars lead 3-1. to one. The other ingredient to the mix, John Casey. Once again, he is outstanding, somehow keeping the puck out of the net and the Oilers out of the game. Well, we needed to have a win. Uh, again, we start a series where we need to be able to win in the other team's building, and, and we've got the first game. Minnesota wins game one. The North Stars are still the belle of the ball. But where did these Cinderella stars come from? The last time they had an invitation to the ball was back in 1981. They lost in the finals that year to the New York Islanders. Since then, though, the North Stars have been unspectacular. In the last four years, they have missed the playoffs twice and lost in the first round twice. This season, they won just 11 of their first 40 games. Naturally, expectations were low. But after the All-Star game, the Stars started to improve. They were just one game under 500 in their last 40 games. But still, few expected this type of performance in the playoffs. The reasons for the North Star success start with John Casey. His goals against average in the regular season was a meager 2.98. In the playoffs, he's lowered it to about two and a half goals a game. But Casey does not deserve all the credit. Our defensemen as a group have been playing a strong game for us for a long time. And we haven't given up a lot of goals in the playoffs. After that, 19 points for Brian Bellows, 15 points each for Dave Gagne and Neil Broughton, and 14 points for Brian Propp, and it looks like that glass slipper fits the North Stars pretty well, at least for now. Ken Cholobek, TSN, in Edmonton. The Buffalo Sabres will have general manager Jerry Meehan and head coach Rick Dudley back uh, with their respective jobs when the 1991-92 hockey season begins. The announcement comes in the wake of a very disappointing regular season and first-round elimination from the playoffs. Meehan has two years remaining on his current contract, while Dudley uh, was renewed for the option year of his, but uh, may not be around for the season after that. Uh, it has not been extended, rather, for the season after that. St. Louis Blue Center, Rick Mahar is retiring after 12 years in the National Hockey League. Mahar played just 24 games this season after suffering an injury in last year's Stanley Cup playoffs. Meanwhile, another St. Louis veteran, Harold Snepps, who announced his retirement earlier this week, now says he might continue playing, depending on what happens in the upcoming expansion draft. Well, not exactly what looks for some help at the World Hockey Championships. And they're off and running for the Roses. Sports Desk is brought to you by Mazda. It just feels right. And by Right Guard Deodorant. Anything else would be uncivilized. And welcome to the show. I'm Teresa Hergert along with Gino Retta. A big day and a busy Saturday in sport. Also ahead, we've got the complete story from Major League Baseball and the NBA playoffs. But we'll start things off with the Campbell Conference Final. The Oilers and North Stars, Minnesota leading the series one game to nothing. Gino, who would have thought? Who would have thought? Certainly not I. The North Stars of the 91 playoffs are a lot like a baby learning to walk. They teetered but successfully took their first step then confidently took their second step just as successfully. Now the stars are surrounded by well-wishers, egging them along, egging the underdog along for the next big stride. No longer anticipating the team to come crashing down and falling on its face. Of course, Peter Klima and the Oilers would love to trip up Minnesota on their way to the cup. First period, scoreless. Stars in the power play. Bobby Smith slides it to Dave Gagne, who puts it by Grand Fuhrer. The North Stars take a 1-0 lead. A few minutes later, the Oilers tie it up. It's Peter Klima to Charlie Huddy. Back to Klima, he throws it towards the net, and somehow it beats John Casey. Ties the game at one. Then a couple minutes later, Klima strikes again. He takes the lead pass, moves in on John Casey, puts it upstairs. Casey gets a piece of it, not enough. Second of the game for Klima, two to one Oilers. But Klima, not done yet. Just minutes later, he completes the natural hat trick. Lindsman to Tikkanen to Klima, in with a backhand. It's three to one Oilers, Klima with the hat trick. Second period, four to one Oilers. Stu Gavin takes out Essatikin and behind the net, then picks up the loose puck and beats Grant Fuhrer, who is well out of his net, and it's 4 2 for the Oilers. Late in the third period, 5 2 Oilers. Martin Jelena picks up Hayward's rebound. Hayward now in goal for Casey. Semenov bats it in out of the air, and it's 6 2. And how do you stop the Oilers? Well, Brian Bellows has an idea. Maybe just grab hold and rip them down to the ice with the rest side. Not much stop the Oilers on this night. Mark Messier all alone in front of the net. Gets it past Brian Hayward, who's left all alone. Actually, he couldn't, but Simpson did slide it to Glenn Anderson, who tucked it in. 
And at 7-2 Oilers at that point, this game was all Edmonds and so much for Minnesota's first early steps. But hey, all this does is ties a series at a game apiece. Minnesota's goals from Dave Gagne to Gavin Edmonton's goal. Klima, a hat trick, is fifth, sixth, and seventh of the playoffs. Anderson, a pair, is fifth and sixth of the playoffs. Huddy is third. Anatoly Semenov, his fifth of the playoffs. Team Canada's gold medal hopes were still alive early this morning at the World Hockey Championships. Now, granted, their chances were slim. They would have to beat Team USA by at least five goals and then hope that the Soviets and Sweden would tie. It was a long shot, but mathematically possible. First, though, the Canadians had to do their part. The Canadians need a whole lot of luck going into this game at the Typhoon. Doesn't look good early, though. David Maley feeds Sean McEachern at the corner of the net. And Team USA takes an early one to nothing lead just two and a half minutes into the game. But 13 seconds later, Murray Craven leaves the puck for Russ Courtnell. He scores, and that ties the game up at one. Still in the first, Darren Fleury, he's behind the net. He sets up Steve Thomas. He puts it in. And Canada leads by one, two to one, after one. In the second, Todd yes, Krieger fires one from Krieger left wing. That one beats score. Sean Burke. That ties the game up at That's three. Still in the second, Trent Yanni gets the screen. Then he lets Trent one go from Yanni high in the score. slot. John Van Viesburg can't stop it. Canada leads by a Gordon score of four Trent to three. Yanni. Later in the second, Joe Sackett passes back to Russ Courtnell. Back to Sackett. He scores. Canada leads six three after two. Now remember, they needed to win by five goals. Start. Late in the third, Canada leading six to four. Steve Larmer shoots from the, score. the slot. Thomas puts it in. Canada leads so seven to four. Less than a minute in the game. Canada needs two game. more goals. I USA with a power play. They score. pull the goalie. Larmer hits the open net. Eight to four for Canada. Then with time expiring, four Rob Blake centers. Jamie McCowan tips this score. one in just as the final seconds tick down on the clock. Canada wins nine to four. Just the margin that they needed. That guaranteed them the silver medal, but they would have to hope that Sweden and the USSR would tie it. So now, on to the gold medal match. And the Swedish fans were out in full force, but how about this? Wild Soviet fans. Early in the first period, we've got Jonas Bergfist. He gets the puck, steps it over the blue line, shoots, goes off the defenseman's stick and pass Andrei Trefilov. Sweden goes up one to nothing. Later on in the first, Alexander Simak, he puts a weak backhand between Wolf Widerwall's pads right there, and that ties the game up. But Widerwall, he rebounds. He looks good after that. He makes a big stop here on Vyacheslav Butsiev, and that ties it up at one after one. In the third, Matt Sundin breaks in, and he beats Trefilov. Sweden leads now by one, two to one the score. Late in the third, Widerwall stops Gusarov. The Soviets just can't get it past him. We had some controversy with less than a minute left. Viktor, Viktor Tikhonov does not pull his goalie. And the Swedes hold on to win the gold for the first time since 1987. The Soviets settle for the bronze medal. So two to one, the final in this one. So let's take a look at the final standings. Sweden finished with five points. That gave them the gold. Canada finished with the silver. USSR the bronze. And USA with three losses. Well, that may be finished out of the medals. Today on Sports Desk, Tom Barrasso gets another chance to turn things around for the Penguins against the Bruins. Is this the final game as a junior for Oshawa's Eric Lindros? And Dave Steve hopes to crush any royal uprising in Kansas City. Hello everyone and welcome to Sports Desk as we wrap up this weekend in sport. I'm Teresa Hergert. Other stories that we'll be looking at in the next half hour. The Padres and Expos wrapped up their series at the Big O Sunday afternoon. We'll have the highlights, and then we'll check in on the NBA as the Pacers and Celtics push their series to a fifth and deciding game. But first to the NHL, the Bruins and Penguins. Boston was leading this series two games to nothing. A different setting, and the Penguins hoping for a different result. Game three was at the Igloo in Pittsburgh. Badger Bob Johnson, the Penguins head coach, has been taking a lot of heat for sticking with Tom Barrasso as his starting goalie despite the fact that Barrasso has given up a couple of weak goals. 
In response to the critics, Johnson says, well, why not ask the devils in caps about Barrasso? Due to Johnson's word, Barrasso was back in the net for the start of game three. But he wasn't the one that was in trouble early. First period, Kevin Stevens finds a low shot from the circle. He beats Moog on the far side. Penguins take a one to nothing lead. Now back to Barrasso. He's looking sharp. He stops Craig Janney. And it's still one nothing for the Penguins. There's been a lot of shadowing going on throughout the series. They pooling all over Lemieux. And Cam Neely and Alf Samuelson were also back at it tonight. Starting to look a little bit like a ballroom dance. Everybody's got a partner. Second period, 2-0 Pittsburgh. Cam Neely sets up Ray Bork in front. He beats Barrasso. Boston trails by a goal. Just 16 seconds later, Grant Jennings puts in Mario Lemieux's rebound. And the Penguins regain their two-goal lead. Alf Samuelson and Cam Neely have been going at it all series. Here Samuelson takes Neely out at the knees. Now this made Mike Milbury absolutely furious. He wanted a penalty on the play. So he grabs a couple of hockey sticks, does a bit of yelling. Didn't do any good. Still second period, Mary Lemieux steals the puck from Gary Galley, moves in on Moog. He puts it upstairs. Four to one Pittsburgh at that point, and the Penguins go on to win game three by that score. So scoring for Pittsburgh, it was Stevens, Francis, and Jennings. For Boston, Ray Bork picked up his seventh at the playoffs. And Marilyn Hugh also scored for the Penguins. So the Bruins lead this series two games to one, despite the outcome of that game. Campbell Conference Final has moved to Bloomington, Minnesota, as the Oilers and North Stars get set to play game three of their series. Tied up at one game apiece, Edmonton finds itself in position of having to win away from home. But for the Oilers, that hasn't been a problem this year. They, along with Minnesota, are the Road Warriors. With more, here is Ken Chilibeck. The Met Center in Bloomington is the site of the next two games of the Campbell Conference Final. First of the Road Warriors to arrive, the North Stars. They came home immediately after Saturday night's game. Now, they had an optional skate and team meeting on their schedule. Home, they say, is where the heart is. The North Stars hope after the lopsided 7-2 loss in game two, it's a place to get back a little pride. I think that, uh, you know, there's a natural instinct for an athlete to, to want to be respected and to have his abilities and his team respected. And even after uh, two great playoff series wins, it doesn't seem like we've achieved that. So we're going to have to win some more if we're going to. Meanwhile, rain greeted the arrival of the Oilers in Minneapolis later in the afternoon. It was right off the plane and onto a bus to the hotel. The Oilers were able to find some skating room Saturday night and took advantage of it against the North Stars. The North Stars only lost once at home so far in the playoffs. They're a tough checking hockey club, especially at home. So a quick start will be very important for the Oilers. It's uh, important for us to uh, be composed. We're expecting a pretty good onslaught from initially in the first period. And uh, if we can get through the first period um, even or uh, maybe up a goal or, or in a close hockey game, we're in pretty good shape. The North Stars with the split in Edmonton now have home ice advantage but both teams have had to win on the road to get this far. We feel that we're a good road club, too. We won in Calgary, and that's one of the toughest buildings to win in. We won in L.A., There's another tough building to win in. So there's nothing saying you can't win here, regardless of what the previous record is. You can throw that out the window right now. We feel uh, we have a very good chance of winning here at the Met. They, uh, we played well in, uh, on this rink in front of our own fans against St. Louis and Chicago, who are two great road teams, and I like our chances in this building. Both clubs appear to be healthy entering these next pair of games here. Now the North Stars trying to regroup and figure out a way to stop the speed of the Oilers, the likes of Essa Tikkanen and Peter Klima. The Oilers, though, know very well the North Stars will be very tough to beat here back home. Ken Chilobek, TSN in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Eric Lindros didn't want to go to the Sioux when they dropped him. Today on Sports Desk, the Stars hope to regain control of the Campbell Final with home ice advantage. The Expos try to play giant killers at the Big O in Montreal. And Nick Mazzoli, the story of a CFL number one that went south. and 
and welcome to Sports Desk. I'm Teresa Herger. Also ahead on the show, we'll take a look at the Wales Conference Final as Boston and Pittsburgh get set for Game 4. And the Jays had the day off, but the Expos were busy at the Big O with the San Francisco Giants. But first to the Campbell Conference Final, Minnesota and Edmonton. And this series was tied at one win apiece heading into Game 3 at the Met Center in Bloomington. It was a crucial game for the North Stars since much of their playoff success has come on home ice. The Stars have held their own on the road, but the key to their success so far has been their amazing record at the Met Center. Heading into Game 3 against the Oilers, the Stars had lost just once on home ice in the playoffs and had won their last five. And a capacity crowd was on hand at the Met Center, only the fifth sellout this season, and they gave their Stars a standing ovation as they came out onto the ice. For Edmonton, Kevin Lowe was back in the lineup after missing six games with tendonitis in his ankle. First period, Mike Medano, he's on the breakaway, and he deeks out Fuhrer. Minnesota goes up one to nothing. A few minutes later, Jeff Boom off for holding, so the Stars capitalize Bellows to Gagne, to Brian Prop. he pops at home. The Stars take a two-goal lead, and the fans go wild. Late in the first, the Stars strike again. Mark Tenorti, he shoots from the point. 3-1 to one Minnesota after just 20 minutes of play. So in the second, Bill Ranford in for Edmonton, and he plays well, dispense his defense. Makes a great stop on Bobby Smith. Then later on in the second, the Stars up 3-2. to two. Bobby Smith just undresses Jeff Bukaboom. He puts the Stars 4-2 to two ahead. But Edmonton gets that back. Messier to Craig Simpson. A nice goal here. And the Oilers trail by one, four to three, the score. Late in the second, Minnesota on the power play. Brian Bellows knocks in the loose puck. Minnesota takes a five to three lead. And as the Stars say, how do you like that? Third period, Minnesota puts the game away. Brian Bellows on the breakaway. He scores. And the Stars go up six to three. They added another seven to three was the final. They take a two games to one lead in this series. Scoring for Minnesota, it was Modano, Prop, Tenorti, Smith, Churla, and Bellows with a pair. For Edmonton, it was Buckberger and Simpson with two. Now, Bellows says that the team isn't bothered by the Rodney Dangerfield stigma, which has followed this team for most of the season. If we can, we can just keep winning games. I don't think the guys ever care if we get any respect in the papers or not. We're just, uh, all year long, we've really pushed to just win, win it for each other in here. All 28 guys and uh, the coaches and the organization. If that's the only one that believes in us, that's fine with us. Minnesota played very well. Uh, we uh, stayed in the game for a while. Every time we get close, we'd shoot ourselves in the foot again. And then they'd take opportunity to power play, which they had working tonight and worked very well. The goal that Bob Smith scored the goal that Brian Bellows scored in the third period was a he's fighting off a check from behind and the game is still uh, on the line when you're playing uh, a team with the with the potential to score that uh, Edmonton has and those were two uh, two plays that are easily recognizable as as huge plays for our club and there was all kinds of them uh, not all of them resulted in goals but we had a lot of big efforts uh, it was obviously not the kind of game that we wanted to play, and and uh, we're going to change that. And, and like I said before, you know, Wednesday night is is a, is a big game for us, and, and we'll be ready, and uh, you'll see a different Oiler hockey team. The element of surprise. The Pittsburgh Penguins used it to their advantage Sunday night when they surprised the Boston Bruins. When Boston took an early two games to nothing lead in this series, many assumed the Bruins would have the easy trip to the Stanley Cup final. Well, someone forgot to tell Bob Johnson and the Penguins they outplayed, out-hustled, and outscored the Bruins by three goals to win the game. Boston still has a two games to one lead in this Wales Conference Final. Game four will be played Tuesday night at the Civic Center in Pittsburgh. A physical game the other night put the Bruins on the limp. Well, you knew this was coming. Just like Cam Neely knew all Samuelson was coming. Mike Milbury is mad. He's mad at all Samuelson. He's mad at the officials. He's mad at his own team. He's going to make some lineup changes in game four. He wants revenge. He's taken enough uh, physical abuse, and, uh, and I don't believe it's been uh, uh, warranted uh, the extent of it. Uh, I think we're going to have to respond to it, and I think we're going to have to play an extremely physical game. Uh, I don't believe that a, uh, a team should be allowed to take uh, late, cheap shot runs at your star players. And uh, if, if, uh, if it's allowed, well, we'll have to respond in our own way. Take care of your own business. 
I guess, and uh, <clears throat> we intend to do that. Most of the physical abuse has come from all Samuelson, and most of it has been directed at Cam Neely, the Bruins' 50-goal scorer. Stopping Cam Neely was part of the Penguins' seven-point plan for beating the Bruins. Obviously, they've made their point. Well, Bob Johnson's seven-point plan, uh, there must have been somewhere in that seven-point plan, make sure you take as many cheap shots as you can against the other team's key players. <clears throat> so the, the professor of hockey has a... Has a and I'm very so often made the correct call in this case. projects himself. Uh, he's also subtly a professor of Junism. Take a look at the replay. I mean, I, I could have blown my knee out and been out for uh, for the rest of the year or even longer. So, I mean, it, it's very, uh, you know, upsetting to me. I looked at the video this morning, and, and I couldn't even tell it in the video. So, you know, if he says it's a knee, I'm sure it's a knee. I don't know why they would lie, but I'm, I was just trying to stand him up and uh, hit him in the neutral zone. I think they've drawn a line in the sand if, or somehow on the ice. And uh, uh, or be, be it for me not, not to accept the confrontation. Um, I think it's too bad. I think it's too bad it has to come to this. Um, but... Uh, that's, that's the way it's got to be. It's deja vu for the Oshawa Generals in the OHL Championship Series. Last year, the Generals were down three games to one against Kitchener, but fought back to win the series in seven games and also win the Memorial Cup. This year, the Generals had dug themselves in the same hole against the Sioux Greyhounds. They stayed alive with a 4-2 win on Sunday and would need a repeat performance Monday night in Game 6 if they had any plans of returning to the National Final but they couldn't do it. It's all over for Eric Lindros and the Generals. They were beaten by Sault Ste. Marie, 4-2 to the final. So the Greyhounds win this series in advance to the Memorial Cup. And you can see live coverage here on TSN beginning Saturday at 7 p.m. It'll be Drummondville and the Sault Ste. Marie. Today on Sports Desk, will the war of words escalate on the ice between the Bruins and Penguins? The Jays look to Jimmy Key to unlock a win against the Rangers. And a dramatic finish to a long game between the Giants and the Expo. Welcome to Sports Desk. I'm Gino Retta. Also ahead in addition to today's top stories, police have decided to press charges against Lenny Dykstra. Kelly Gruber goes on the disabled list, and the Celtics and Pistons open their second round action. But first, the words, the war of words is settled on the ice, where it should be. Game four of the Wales Conference Final. Boston leading two games to one, but Mike Milbury, head coach of the Boston Bruins, very upset about what he called a chippy, dirty performance by the Pittsburgh Penguins in game number three. He actually called Badger Bob Johnson, Pittsburgh's head coach, the professor of goonism. Milbury said if the referees wouldn't curtail Pittsburgh's dirty play, he and the Bruins would have to take matters into their own hands. And after these comments, of course, the Pittsburgh fans put together some signs to say thank you. How about that for Mike Milbury? Or maybe take a Valium. Milbury doesn't care, though, takes it in stride. Game's first shift, shades of game three. Alf Samuelson stands up, Cam Neely. Minutes later, it's payback time. Chris Nyland dishes a big elbow on Samuelson. Midway through the first period of play, Craig Janney tries to check Lemieux, but Lemieux fights it off, feeds Ari, and Ari tucks it in for the game's first goal. 1-0 Pittsburgh. Late in the first, Pittsburgh on the power play. Lemieux all alone on the doorstep, but... Andy Moog shuts the door, lying and sprawled out on the ice. Midway through the second, more pressure by the Penguins. Ron Francis comes out in front, feeds Joe Mullen, who slips it by Moog through all kinds of traffic, and Pittsburgh was up two to nothing. Samuelson and the Penguins keeping a close eye on Neely. A close eye, a close glove, a close stick, etc., etc. Midway through the third, Pittsburgh with a giveaway in their own zone. Dave Christian shoots one through a very screened Tom Barrasso, and the Bruins are back within a goal. But seconds later, Mark Recchi goes around the Boston goal, centers to Mario Lemieux, and Mario squirts it through Moog, and that was it for Boston. The door was shut on this one as Pittsburgh defeats the Boston Bruins by a score of 4-1 to to tie the series at two games apiece. Goal scorers for Pittsburgh, Bob Airy, Joe Mullen, Mario Lemieux, and Kevin Stevens. 
for Boston. Dave Christian, his eighth of the series. Well, forget the talk about the Cinderella team of the playoffs. Forget the talk about another potential upset. The North Stars have proven they can hold their own with any other team in the playoffs right now. Thanks to a convincing 7-3 win on Monday night, the Stars lead the Oilers two games to one in their best of seven Campbell Conference Final. Game four at Bloomington on Wednesday night. Only four current North Stars were on the team the last time Minnesota made it to the Conference Final. But there's no shortage of late round playoff experience on the team. Brian Propp, a good example of that. Stanley Cup playoffs are nothing new for number 16, Brian Propp. Now, Prop was with the highly successful Philadelphia Flyers for 11 seasons. Four of those, he scored 40 goals or more. Now, last season, he was traded to the Boston Bruins and helped the Bruins all the way to the finals. But now, here he is, a step away again from a final series. This is just great. I'm, I'm really enjoying it a lot this year. I think that the biggest reason that I'm enjoying it so much is because I'm playing in Minnesota, and we weren't expected to do what we've done so far. Prop has quickly turned into one of the team leaders in the North Stars. It hasn't taken long to earn the respect from his teammates. Well, I think any time that a player has played in a lot of uh, playoff games, that it comes into effect that you have to show that leadership between periods, during games. Sometimes you have to slow the play down. You have to say, wait a minute, hold on. Let's just slow it down and let's, we, can, we can continue to come back or we've got a lead. Let's uh, look at how much time is left. Little things that count. It's kind of quiet, but you know, he says what he has to say in the dressing room and you know, pretty much everybody listens to what he has to say. He's been long, around a long time. This city is now home for Brian Propp. For how long, he says he's not really certain because after this season, he becomes a free agent. With expansion coming up, he becomes a gun for hire. But right now, Propp says only one thing on his mind, and that's another shot at a Stanley Cup ring. Ken Chulebeck, TSN, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Paul Anka is just a couple of days away from finalizing a deal to buy about a... <laughs> Today on Sports Desk, putting the wood to Edmondson, Minnesota looks to go up three games to one. Never say never again, Nolan Ryan goes for his second straight no-hitter. And the Lakers look to make it two in a row over Golden State in the NBA playoffs. Desk is brought to you by Suzuki, makers of Swift, Samurai, and Sidekick. If it's Suzuki, it's all right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Sports Desk. I'm Gord Miller. Also coming up in this half hour, is the world ready for Brian Bosworth, movie star? We'll find out later. But first, the Stanley Cup playoffs and the Edmonton Oilers in a familiar position. Must win is nothing new for the Oilers. The defending Stanley Cup champions have faced the situation many times before. Last year in the Campbell Conference Final, the Oilers were down two games to one against Chicago. Mark Messier rallied back to lead them to victory in game four. Edmonton then took the series in six. Messier was again in the spotlight before game four of the series against the North Stars. The captain of what many were saying was a sinking Edmonton ship. John Muckler is certainly hoping his team could get back in the series or he'd be the head coach of that sinking ship and needed his power play to get on track. First period, game scoreless. Edmonton opens the scoring. Craig McTavish picks up the puck in the slot, beats John Casey, 1-0 Edmonton. But just a few minutes later, the Stars tie it up. Mark Bureau comes down the wing on the two-on-one. He's shot just under the crossbar, 1-1. Seconds later, the Stars take the lead. The shot from the point goes off the post, goes right to Mike Madano. He's got Grant Bureau at his mercy, and it's 2-1 Minnesota. Then things get ugly. Scramble in front of the Minnesota goal. Martin Jelena with his helmet off. cross check from behind by Bobby Smith. He's got five minutes of the game misconduct, but Edmonton couldn't click on the power play. In the second, Stars lead 3-0-1. Neil Wilkinson allowed to move in and take the shot. He beats a screen Grant Fuhr, 4-1 Minnesota. John Muckler's got plenty to worry about this hockey game. Late in the second, the Stars strike again. Brian Bellows one times the shot. It hits Neil Broughton in front and gets by Grant Fuhr. 5-1 Minnesota. And the happiest man in the Twin Cities is owner Norm Green. The Stars go on to win it by a final score of 5-1. to one. Bureau, Madano, Gagne, Wilkinson, and Broughton score for the North Stars. McTavish scores for Edmonton. The North Stars lead the series 3-1. to one And chalk up John Muckler as a Minnesota believer. 
I have to give uh, Minnesota a great deal of credit. I mean, they played a solid game tonight. They deserve to uh, win, and uh, we're going back home, and uh, we're going to regroup, and we're going to show up on Friday night. We know how difficult it is to, to win that fourth game, and when you lose that fifth game and have to come home, the pressure starts getting to you a little bit, and we've had it with Calgary, and Calgary beat us in game six and forced to seventh, and with L.A., uh, the same thing. So hopefully we can just put a little pressure on them and see how they react to it. Start of the year, everyone said we had, uh, you know, when we were losing, we got too many old players. You know, we recruited Smith and Prob. We had a lot of old guys. Now it's uh, we had great experience, and those guys are leading our team. So it's uh, it's funny how things change around in you know six, seven months time. Uh, our power plays worked well, and uh, Dave Gagne has been a big part of our power play. He organizes a lot of the plays, and he's there when the puck hits the ice at faceoffs. He scored a nice goal tonight. Uh, to beat good teams, you have to have a lot of players playing well, and, and we've had that, and we've needed it. You can see that again. People expecting the Wales Conference Final to turn into the Pennsylvania Chainsaw Massacre may have been disappointed on Tuesday night, but the result of Game 4 of the series suits the Pittsburgh Penguins just fine. It was only a rough game from Boston's perspective. The Bruins return home for Game 5 of the series, now tied at 2 with the Penguins. They're needing to reestablish some momentum. Suddenly, it's advantage Penguins as the series goes back to Boston. Uh, the way we're playing right now, we have a lot of confidence in ourselves, and uh, we know that we can uh, play against Boston and win some games. So, uh, um, you know, if, if we keep playing the way uh, we are right now, we have a good chance to win the, the series. The first 20 minutes will be important for the simple fact that I'm sure they're going to come out fired up, and it's going to be our job to uh, to really try and take the the edge of their fans away from them and uh, and try and bottle them up as much as possible, and, and really uh, quiet the storm. We've got to be desperate right from the start of the game. I mean, you know, we all know it's, it's still two all and, and it's not a desperate situation, but we have to play like this. And when we do that, we play better. Obviously, if you could uh, get the key ingredient and throw it in the dressing room and have it work, uh, we'd love to do it, but it doesn't work that way. It's got to come from within, and uh, we're definitely going to have to find it because we're running out of time. In junior hockey, the Memorial Cup is just days away. And the Spokane... Today on Sports Desk, the Bruins are back home trying to knock off the upstart Penguins. David Wells, white hot against the White Sox. And the Pistons are trying to catch up to Bird at the Boston Garden. everyone and welcome to Sports Desk. I'm Teresa Herbert. Also ahead, we'll take a look toward the start of this weekend's Memorial Cup and we'll look back with a pair of legends in sport. But first, we'll take you to the Wales Conference Final Game 5 between the Bam Bruins and the Penguins. Mike Milbury's Night of a Thousand Goons kind of backfired on him in Game 4 against the Penguins, so it was back to Boston and back to the drawing board for the Bruin coach. His biggest concerns have got to be keeping his players out of the penalty box and keeping Mario Lemieux off the score sheet. Tough tasks in Pittsburgh, but so far this series had belonged to the home teams, and Boston's small ice surface is usually bad news for the NHL's big scorers. So Mike Milbury looking to take advantage of home ice advantage. Just 40 seconds into the game, the Bruins open the scoring via the Sweeney connection. It was Bob to Dawn, and the Bruins lead one to nothing. That lead did not last long. Scott Young sends a pass rink-wide to Kevin Stevens. He moves in, beats Andy Moog, and that ties the game up at one. Penguins later go ahead on the power play. Stevens slides it across the big Mario. He tucks it in under Moog, and the Penguins take a one-goal lead. Two to one is the score. Late in the first, the Penguins now leading three to one. Boston on the power play. Ken Hodge wins a draw to Ray Bork. It was Craig Janney who scored that one. And it is 3-2 after one. Second period, Cam Neely continues his preoccupation with Ulf Samuelson, who has not scored in two games. Still in the second, Young drops to Lemieux. He beats Stevens, that great shot. And the Penguins go up 4-2. Late in the second, Brian Troche comes to Paul Stanton. He snaps a pass, Moog. And the Penguins go up 5-2. Then in the third, Milbury tries to kickstart his team for the big final period. But it is not going to happen. One away in the period, Larry Murphy lets a screenshot go. Six to two for Pittsburgh. 
No cheers in the garden tonight. The Penguins win this one 7-2. And hey, Norm, what has happened to the Bruins? The Penguins grab a three games to two lead in this series. Scoring for the Penguins, Kevin Stevens picked up his 12th and 13th of the playoffs. Other goal scorers, it was Lemieux, Troche, Stanton, Murphy, and Samuelson. The two goal scorers for Boston were Sweeney and Jen. And while the Penguins are one win away from an upset, the Minnesota North Stars are also just a single victory away from upsetting the defending Stanley Cup champions. Minnesota grabbed a three games to one lead in this series the other night with a big win over the Edmonton Oilers. One person that couldn't be happier about the turn of events is new owner Norm Green. And with the story, here's Ken Chilebeck. Outside the Met Center, everything seems to be the same. But inside, it is a whole new hockey game. The arena is packed. The atmosphere is electric. No one would have ever predicted this type of turnaround, even owner Norm Green. I really thought it was an outside five years, and if we got lucky, three. Uh, as it turns out, it's three months, and that was some kind of a miracle story. But with their wins on the ice, the North Stars are winning fans. Season's ticket base has gone from some 3,000 to over 6,000, most of those in the past few months. I think that the, uh, the fans being here is because of the winning, of course. And, and that's the most important thing. On a scale of 1 to 10, when we started uh, this whole conversation uh, uh, eight months, nine months ago, we always said that what we do, all the things we do, is 20%, and winning is 80%. Now, Green tried everything to attract fans, everything from money giveaways to TV commercials. It's Bobby's first goal in the playoffs and gives the North Stars a commanding lead. But Green is a hands-on owner. The fans know him. He's there every game to answer the questions. The excitement that you see on the ice and in the fans, in the stands now, is being translated into that long-term type of support, which is the season ticket. Green says he doesn't feel comfortable with all the attention he is getting, but he's not stopping. He's changing the team's uniform for next year, and he's working on refurbishing the arena and make it part of a huge shopping mall being built next door. The North Star is certainly a great story so far for the National Hockey League, no matter how they end up finishing this season. Norm Green knows, though, the work is far from over. The big job will be to get the fans to come back next year. But as his motto is, if you're having fun, buy some season's tickets. Well, right now, his fans are having a lot of fun. Ken Chilebeck, TSN, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was a costly day for Montreal Shane Corson. He was hit with a four-game suspension for cross-checking Boston's Ray Bork in this year's playoffs. Then he was fined $500 for boarding Bruins defenseman Gary Galley after the buzzer had sounded in Game 7 of the Adams Division Final. Corson will serve his suspension in October at the start of the 91-92 season. And the St. Louis Blues may have made an early exit from the playoffs, but the owners haven't lost their confidence in their executive staff. The Blues threw their support behind General Manager Ron Caron, Head Coach Brian Sutter, and Assistants Bob Berry and Wayne Thomas by giving them new two-year contracts. Caron said that he's glad he'll be around for the next two years because the St. Louis Blues have some unfinished business to take care of. Fans in Quebec City may be Today on Sports Desk, the Oilers trying to fight off elimination. Roberto Alomar knocking the socks off Chicago's bullpen. While one of the men he was traded for, Fred McGriff, is looking good in his new digs. Sports Desk is brought to you by Suzuki, makers of Swift, Samurai, and Sidekick. If it's Suzuki, it's all right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Sports Desk. I'm Chris Edens. Also coming up in the next half hour, a look at the Memorial Cup-bound Sioux St. Marie Greyhounds. And round two of the NBA playoffs continues on two fronts. But first, we're off to game five of the Campbell Conference Final. The Minnesota North Stars had a chance to do something no other team has done since expansion back in 1967. In that time, the playoff team with the worst regular season record 
has never made it to the Stanley Cup final. But here they were, leading the Campbell Conference final three games to one and looking to wrap it up Friday night in Edmonton. First it was the Blackhawks, then the Blues. Would the Oilers be Minnesota's next playoff victim? Let's head to the Northlands Coliseum in Edmonton and find out. Pre-game skate, tempers flare, alternate official Kerry Fraser and Randy Mitten try to break it up. Oilers try to lay down the law early in this one. Mark Messier with a wicked elbow on Gaetan Duchesne. North Stars open the score and while on the power play, Brian Bellows to Brian Propp. The rebound comes to Mark Tenorti, 1-0 Minnesota. Minnesota's 32nd power play goal of the playoff that ties an NHL record. A few minutes later, Glenn Anderson smashes into John Casey. They mix it up for a while. Tempers flared in this game. Later in the first period, Stars break out. Three on two, Duchesne to Mark Bureau. Great wrist shot that beats Grant Fuhr. 2-0 North Stars. In the second period, Tenorti gives up the puck. Asa Tikkanen makes him pay for it. Tikkanen breaks in all alone. Beats John Casey on the forehand. 2-1 Minnesota. Oilers get another chance right away. But Casey stops Martin Jelena coming way out to challenge him. Third period, Anderson moves wide of the goal, sends a blind pass out to Messier in front, and he scores. We're tied at two. But the North Stars bounce right back. Stu Gavin feeds Bobby Smith. Smith goes to the forehand, shakes off Esetikin in his check. Great goal, 3-2 Minnesota with time winding down. Oilers apply the pressure, but Minnesota weathers the storm. North Stars hold on to win it. 3-2 is the final score. As you see the clock wind down, the North Stars advancing to the Stanley Cup final for the first time since back in 1981. The goal scores, Tenorti, Bureau, and Smith for Minnesota, Tikkanen, and Messier getting the goals for Edmonton. The North Stars winning the series in five games. They win it four games to one. Speaking of Cinderella stories, which is what the North Stars have been called throughout this one, Chicago in 1938 at a percentage of 385, lowest in the NHL, they went on to win the Stanley Cup. Minnesota has the second worst percentage at the end of the regular season. They advanced to the final now. Can they match what Chicago did? Detroit, Montreal, Toronto, all with terrible records. They all advanced to the final, but not winning the Stanley Cup. Happy in the North Stars dressing room. Let's say we're going to come in here and win the series in five games. I would have said, oh, well, you got to be kidding. It's going to be a long, hard one. And, uh, I tell you, this team just pulled together so hard. It's just, just a great feeling. We've got so many young guys who are just too dumb to lose composure. I mean, we just play, and uh, that's a good thing about this team. We just play, and uh, you know, we're winning, and we uh, gratitude for that. Earlier on in the year, we we might have ended up tying or losing a game in that situation, but the last 40 games we've been playing great in that situation, and we ended up killing off the time and, and getting the win. I think we were beat by a uh, a better team this year. They were really inspired. Uh, whether it was the Cinderella team they talk about or uh, uh, maybe uh, playing for Bob Ganey and uh, his wife, I don't know. But whatever it was, they sure played their hearts out. It's an amazing story so far, that's for sure. The Pittsburgh Penguins are now just one win away from their first ever trip to the Stanley Cup final. The Penguins bombed Boston 7-2 on Thursday night, grabbing a 3-2 series lead. It's to the point now where Pittsburgh is basically walking all over the Bruins, and Boston head coach Mike Milbury knows it'll be almost impossible to stop their momentum. It's, it's time to regroup. Clearly, we, uh, our biggest obstacle going into Saturday night's game is going to be the, our own uh, minds and emotions, and we've got to uh, pick ourselves up and uh, somehow find a way to beat this club that's playing very well right now. And Penguins coach Bob Johnson says winning their third straight game was important, but he adds that the fourth win in any best of seven series is always the toughest. The Penguins can wrap up the Wales Conference title Saturday night on home ice. Want to buy a hockey team? The latest on the block is the Pittsburgh Penguins. Price tag, $50 million U.S. Other teams reportedly up for sale if the price is right include New Jersey, the Islanders, and Winnipeg. And of course, $50 million is what both Ottawa and Tampa Bay have to pay for their NHL franchises, their expansion franchises. And the word is, they're both ahead of schedule and will receive full approval come next December. Everyone expect a good look. Today on Sports Desk, can the Penguins continue to skate circles around the Bruins? 
Those darn socks come up short at the Sky Dome. And the Pistons try to wrestle one away from the Celtics. Welcome to Sports Desk, everyone. I'm Chris Seaton. He's also coming up in the next half hour, a look at the Memorial Cup opening night action from Quebec City. And Rick Mears leads the parade of qualifiers at the Indianapolis 500. But first, game six of the Wales Conference Final. The Pittsburgh Penguins, one win away from their first trip ever to the Stanley Cup Final. These are the same Pittsburgh Penguins who spent most of the regular season without their superstar, Mario Lemieux, but still never missed a beat. Now in the playoffs, they're without all-star defenseman Paul Coffey, but again... You'd never know it. Saturday night, Game 6, Wales Conference Final. The Penguins hoping to wrap up the series on home ice. And just like the other games in this series, this one also very chippy. Chris Nyland roughs up Phil Bork behind the net. And in the second period, Mark Recchi hammers Bob Sweeney. No score in the second period. Mario Lemieux inside out on Bob Sweeney, but then rings it off the goal post. With the Bruins on the power play, Jim Weimer's shot from the point. Tipped home by Cam Neely, his ninth power play goal of the playoffs. That ties him with Mike Bossy's record in 19, uh, 1981. Then with the Bruins on another power play, Ken Hodge Jr. to Bob Sweeney. He fans on the shot, but Hodge is there to put it past Tom Barrasso. And it's 2-0 Boston. But the Penguins come roaring back on the power play. Lemieux feeds Larry Murphy. Murphy beats Andy Moog. Boston's lead is now cut to just one, and they keep it coming. Mark Recchi comes around the net. He is stopped. Phil Moore grabs the rebound, gets his fourth of the playoffs. We're tied at two after two. Just over four minutes to play in the third score. is now tied at three. Gordy Roberts, great pass off the voice to Recchi. He makes no mistake. 4-3 Penguins. After the Lemieux empty netter, the clock winds down as the Penguins are going to the Stanley Cup Final. For the first time in their 24-year history, they win the last four games in the series after losing the first two to win the Wales Conference title. Final score, Penguins 5, Bruins 3, goal scores, Neely, Hodge, and Sweeney for Boston, Murphy, Phil Bork, Roberts, Recchi, and Lemieux for the Penguins. It's the first time two 1967 expansion teams will meet in the Stanley Cup Final. So the matchup now, the Stanley Cup Final begins May 15th, Wednesday next week. Game one, Penguins with home ice advantage, but that hasn't seemed to bother the North Stars so far in the playoffs. They have been very strong. Now about those North Stars, Norm Green says he expected it would take about five years to build a winner in Minnesota, three years if he was lucky. He had no way of knowing it would happen in just three short months. Before the All-Star break, the Stars were playing very mediocre hockey and fan support was a joke. But since the All-Star break, the Stars are the winningest team in the National Hockey League. Friday night, they knocked off the defending Stanley Cup champion Edmonton Oilers and now find themselves just four wins away from their first Stanley Cup title ever. Ken Chilebeck reports. Check the other teams no single tonight. player could be singled out for the North Star success. It was a team effort. An example, just when the Oilers appeared to be gaining some momentum in Game 5, a goal by veteran Bobby Smith put the North Stars back in the lead to stay. What do you say of Bobby Smith? Big goal for us right after theirs and uh, picked us back right where we started. I'm a very happy man, as, as is all 20 guys in this room. Everyone played great. We played as a team, all 20 guys. And I'm also happy for the guys that, that are dressed along with the team and haven't been playing but are working with us. They're the ones that are giving everyone support. And, and it's just great for this whole organization. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. But, uh, you know, I'll probably, uh, before we go home, Bob's going to probably tell us, uh, you know, we got one more series to go. So. You know, he's always thinking ahead. He's probably got a game plan going already, and uh, we're going to hear about it soon. So we, we want the cup now. You're in the Stanley Cup final? It's great, man. It's, uh, <laughs> it's unbelievable. And, you know, Has it hit home, or is it going to take a while? This, I think it's going to take a while. We're just we're still searching for that, you know, the cup, and hopefully we can bring in that, too. The Oilers, a team who looked beaten and beaten up. The long, grueling series they had to get here was maybe just too much for them. They had nothing else to give. It's always got to be a winner and loser. We've been at uh, both ends, and uh, I think that uh, Minnesota deserved to win. They played uh, pretty strong hockey. They're a good hockey team right now. I don't think we had as, as many good quality shots as maybe we could have could have had, but um, 
Again, you can't take anything away from them. They played a good hockey game. They're a good, disciplined hockey team. They play well on their end, and they, uh, they did all the little things right. For the Oilers, there'll be a lot of questions to be answered in the offseason. Questions such as, will Mark Messier remain an Oiler? Now, the Oilers went through a lot of adversity to get to this particular point and only to lose to the Minnesota North Stars. But it came right down with maybe that adversity all caught up to them. There'll be a few changes, but uh, we've got a lot of great players. Those kids are playing well. Uh, some of the veterans, uh, I guess it's any uh, business, uh, any team in this business, there's always change, but uh, always positive change on the Oilers. Ken Chulabak, TSN in Edmonton. And the North Stars arrived home to a hero's welcome after Friday night's win over Edmonton. Hundreds of fans jammed the Minneapolis airport carrying signs and miniature Stanley Cups. Hard to believe this is the same city where the North Stars and hockey were almost invisible just a couple of months ago. However, upset wins over Chicago, St. Louis, and the defending Stanley Cup champion Oilers has turned this town into a Stanley Cup city. They are proud of their team. Gay Lafleur and the Quebec Ramparts won the Memorial Cup back.